We do know what caused the H2S production. The H2S is produced by a kind of microbe. We used to call them Archibacteria, now we just call them Archaea. Science was very surprised, like in the last 10 years, to discover that half of the living mass of the ocean is different kinds of Archaea. These are not bacteria. These are not our kind of eukaryotic cells. This is a form of life we didn't even know existed 20 years ago. And now, because of improvements in technology, which we did help produce, you know, with machine learning and neural nets and all that, we have new instrumentation. And we now know that half the life of the ocean is these mysterious ancient bacteria called Archaea. And one type of Archaea produces H2S. And we know what causes those scary bacteria or archaea to thrive. There are two key conditions. One of them is low oxygen. And that's the number one thing. They thrive in environments where there is low, low, or no oxygen. And they also need food and nutrition. Now, when you think about it, that's a pretty easy recipe. And you can do that in an aquarium. And after I read Combs' paper, I said, you know what? I need to check. This doesn't sound impossible. So I did a Google search on the term stinky aquarium. You know, have kids done this by accident? And it turns out they may have. Now, there are other ways to generate H2S in the air. It's not only the archaea. Here I'm talking about something called euxinia, but there's also eutrophia, which is well known to any environmental engineer. To really analyze the risk, we have to analyze what causes these archaea to proliferate. I think there are two factors, low oxygen and nutrition. One of the things we need to do is better focus research. People should be measuring exactly what are the cutoffs where these things start proliferating. This is the kind of an experiment that high school kids could do practically. But there's a lot of very basic experimental work that we can do to be more certain exactly when this stuff explodes. And if we want to know how long we have to live or die, we really should know exactly, mathematically, what are the conditions that cause these things to explode. Peter Ward had a different theory. Of course you need low oxygen. We all know that. But he was hoping maybe there are certain kind of purple bugs that might stop the H2S before it gets to the surface. And maybe you need to have an ocean that is not acid. But there are a lot of reasons why I don't really believe that theory. And one of them is that the chemistry doesn't, doesn't look right. Because if you've got enough H2S, you're not really going to stop it that easily. But we need research. For the time being, the best knowledge we have is that there are two factors, nutrition and oxygen. And the fact of life we need to face up to is the ocean already has the nutrition. 50,000 years ago, we had low oxygen in the ocean. 50,000 years ago, there was an event, what Ward would call stratified ocean, where there was very low oxygen in the bottom of the ocean, but we didn't have an H2S catastrophe. But we didn't have as much fertilizer going into the ocean. We have lots of fertilizer going on in the ocean now. And this is an area where we know humans have made a huge difference because we know most of the land of this planet is now going to human agriculture. This is where humans really have changed everything. And we use fertilizer in huge quantities. There's a beautiful book out there called The Alchemy of Air, which describes how the discovery of fertilizers was a great breakthrough, prevented mass famine, but it also caused huge fertilizer flows to the ocean. So right now, my gut feeling is, if we get low oxygen ocean, the fertilizers we're already putting in there are enough to cause mass death, H2S proliferation. So the real thing that's saving us is the oxygen. And thank God we have these currents bringing oxygen to the deep ocean. And for the last 50,000 years, we've had very powerful currents called thermohaline currents bringing oxygen to the deep ocean and from there up really the whole ocean. And so these crazy bugs can't take over the whole ocean. Maybe a few little patches here and there. The other day I saw a TV news show in Florida 
and there was a place where they had a little bit of low oxygen in some place around the swamps. And I saw the face of the TV reporter <laughs> smelling this stuff. And I said, you know, I wonder, was this Euxinia or Eutrophia? Do we know what's in this stinky water? And my gut feeling is we don't. You know, our ability to know exactly what species of microbe is out there and doing what, it, it, we shouldn't exaggerate how much we know. But in small places like the Black Sea has a Euxinia problem, but it doesn't have that many waves, so it hasn't yet killed the Russian Navy in Sevastopol. I would be surprised someday a cloud could come up because the Black Sea is full of poison in the depths of the Black Sea. But it's a fairly calm sea, unlike the Pacific Ocean. If, if the Pacific Ocean goes anoxic, we go dead. Every environmental engineer learns about eutrophia because what happens is, um, let's say in a river, you got too much fertilizer going into the river, too much food, the algae proliferate, the oxygen decreases, and, well, bad stinky things happen, okay? And, and you can smell a lot of rivers that way. But the thing is, that's ordinary algae. I know we have local eutrophia in many places, but this Euxinia is what we observe with the mass death. We know the depths of the Black Sea have all this H2S, and that we know. Okay? I should know more, but, you know, that we really need a systematic research program to pull these things together. But this is, this is just the best that I know, and uh, I haven't seen anyone else really pushing these limits. So, I asked myself, okay, how about these currents? How about the oxygen? Are we going to see an interruption of these currents the way we did in the past when there was a big increase in CO2? So I looked up data from NOAA, and if you look at this picture, you'll see it has colors to show you how deep the oxygen bottom water is on different sides of the Antarctic. That's where the oxygen comes from. There's a certain amount of oxygen that comes from the North Pole, but most of the oxygen in the oceans comes from the Antarctic, from big currents, bringing the oxygen from the surface near the Antarctic through the Pacific Ocean, through the Atlantic Ocean, through the whole world. This is a map that shows how thick the layer is of oxygen-bearing bottom water around different sides of the Antarctic. And on the Atlantic side, it doesn't look bad. But on the Pacific side, um, well, it's bad. <laughs> and you'll also see numbers in red that show you how much it's been decreasing over the last 20 odd years. What is the annual rate of decrease of the Antarctic bottom water? And when I looked at this, I said, holy something or other, <laughs> holy H2S. Because if I look at the annual decrease on the Pacific side versus how deep the oxygen layers are, it looks like 40 years. And when I first saw this, I said, oh my God. In 40 years, we are on track to losing that oxygen source. Are we 40 years from this event Peter Ward talks about? Are we 40 years from an explosion of these bacteria. And when bacteria explode, they explode very, very quickly. When the critical conditions are reached, these things really multiply fast. Are we 40 years from this really scary event? That was my response looking at it. But I've had a chance to, to think more about it. Um, this is just the rate of decrease in the current year. Is this a linear decrease that's going to go end in 40 years and then we all die? Or is it going to be one of these asymptotic things where the rate gradually gets slow as we get to the bottom and it's never bad enough to cause the archaea? So we don't know. This is not something I would leave to chance. I'm not going to say, oh, I don't know, so I don't care. I'm going to say, hey, I don't know. Maybe we're dead, maybe we're not. Let's find out. This is what we ought to do if we're rational. If we might die or we might not, we should try to find out, and I've been trying to find out as best I can if this stuff starts shooting out 
where do people start dying? And that's what this red stuff is. This is where outgassing occurs from the ocean to the land or the atmosphere. It's not like the Black Sea. The Black Sea has relatively little outgassing. But in the Pacific Ocean, there are waves and currents and gas does get to the surface. One thing that's not on this chart is the Humboldt current. Um, I had a chance to visit the Humboldt current on a cruise ship a few months ago. It was really amazing to stand there on the equator, noontime, shivering because it was 60 degrees. Because this Humboldt current brings the cold, oxygenated water up to the surface. And that's why we have a whole lot of fish in the Pacific Ocean. You know, California, Peru, Chile all benefit from all this fish. If the oxygen starts decreasing, they're going to start losing fish before the poison comes up. So after I saw these curves, I started really, really worrying. Because if we're 40 years from this kind of event, with a poison coming up from the ocean, well, that's a risk that worried me. We don't know how low the oxygen has to get before the archaea come. And one thing I ended up doing was reading this paper by Sarah Perky. I think this is the best scientific knowledge we have today. She cites a lot of important work about where the oxygen is coming from, what are the trends, the best knowledge we have today on the future of oxygen in the ocean. The resounding conclusion is, golly, we don't know. Maybe it's as bad as it looks, maybe it's not, we don't know. And so then the next question is, what do we know? How can we find out? Are we going to live or are we going to die or not already?